All right. Um, any questions concerning your project design? Yes. You have requirements with your scope? Yes. Who do for that? What do you do for requirements? Well, let's, let's, let's quiz the rest of the class. What do you do for requirements? What are the requirements? The second part, the scope part, the requirements. How to satisfy the visitor's goals. All right, that's a good, good start. And that's absolutely right. The goal, remember, the goals are what people want to achieve. All right, so your goal, again, and, and I'll, I'll use, I'll use uh, the band website as an example because that seems to be pretty straightforward and I've been using it consistently. A band's goal might be to gain more fans. All right, that's a goal. That's why they are creating the website. That's what they want to achieve. Now, there's a lot of ways that a band could try to achieve that goal. All right, one way that they could try to achieve that goal is by giving away um, free music. All right, giving away a, a one song, one free download for example, or have a download of the month or, or whatever. That would be a way that they could potentially attract new listeners because the word could spread and people could visit it. And if you get a song for free, you're going to download it and you listen to it, you might like it, you might become a fan of the band. So in that case, the requirement would be something that you're going to put on the site to try to achieve one of your goals. So if your goal is to gain new fans, one of your requirements might be the site's going to contain one free song to download. That's a requirement. In other words, it has to, it's going to be on the site. So think of the requirements as specific content that you're going to put on the site in order to achieve the goal. All right? So if another goal would be to keep fans informed, to keep your current fans informed of what the band is doing, all right? How could you achieve that? Well, you could have a news section. So maybe one of the requirements would be there'll be a news section that will talk about things that the band has been involved in lately. There'll be a tour schedule that will say where the band is going to be playing over the next six months um, and things like that. So for every goal that you have, the goal is something that you want to achieve. The requirement is specific content you're going to put on your site in order to achieve it. All right. So everything that you define as a requirement should relate to one of the goals. And the reason I said that your answer, something that you're going to do to, to fulfill the visitor's goals was a good start, is it's both the visitor's goals and it's the goals of the organization making the site. All right. Both the organization and the visitors have goals. In other words, if I'm working for the band and I'm creating their website, the band has some goals. So do people visiting the site. A good website will accommodate the goals of both groups of people. All right. So when Lorraine Community College creates a website for for um, it, it, it's uh, for for the community, Lorraine Community College has some goals. We create the site for some reason. All right. But people are visiting the site for reasons as well. So a good website will accommodate both the goals of the people that are creating the site and the goals of the people that are visiting the site. If it accommodates one but not the other, then it's not going to be a very effective site. All right? Um, it's only going to be an effective site if it really serves the goals both of the organization and of the people that are visiting the site. And the requirements are specific content that you're going to put on the site to help you achieve the goals. Um, a, a store, let's say I have a, a jewelry store, all right, uh, a jewelry store, uh, maybe the goal is to increase sales by 20%. That might be a goal of the store, a goal of the people that are creating the website. Well, what are specific things that you could put on the site to increase sales? Well, there's a lot of them, right? First of all, we could, we could do online sales. 
So maybe that would be a requirement, that we're going to allow people to purchase our goods online. That would be a way to increase sales. Another way to increase sales might be to offer online specials, where there's coupons, that certain items, there's a coupon for 15% off or, or something like that, that you could print and take into the store and, and uh, get a purchase. So that would be another thing that you could put on the site. So the requirements are all the specific things that you're going to put on the site that help you and your visitors achieve the goals. Um, does that clear it up or still a little fuzzy or? Okay. Are there other questions about the project design? The one thing, both the goals and the requirements should be about specific content. Um, it shouldn't be um, talking about basic web design. For example, a lot of times students will say that a goal or a requirement of the site is that it has a good, clear navigation. That's not really a goal, right? Because that's not why people are visiting your site. I'm not going to go to ESPN.com to admire their navigation. Go there and like, wow, look at those links. Look how beautiful they are. Look how clear they are. All right. Um, that's not why I'm visiting the site. And indirectly it helps me achieve my goals, but the navigation in itself doesn't help me achieve, doesn't achieve my goal. It may point me and help me go get in the right direction, but that's not a goal nor is that a requirement. The goals and requirements should re uh, represent specific sort of content related things. Other questions? Question? Okay. All right. So that's going to be important for the rest of the semester and bring any questions that you have uh, to class concerning that. That is due today, if I'm not mistaken. All right. People ask me when it's due. It, you know, is it due by a certain time? And the answer is no, it's due today. So if you turn it in at 11.59, in 59 seconds, that will be fine. All right. Um, if for whatever reason, like I've had a couple people email me, they've been ill or whatever, and, and they're not going to get it in for a day or two, again, just let me know. You don't have to let me know details, but just let me know that there's an issue and you're going to turn something in a little bit later, and I'm fine with that. Uh, and that applies to other late assignments as well. Um, I'm most interested in you completing the work and, uh, and doing well on it. So if you get points taken off or if you um, haven't turned something in, you're, you're welcome. it's always going to benefit you to turn it in. Um, I reserve the right to take points off, but I also reserve the right to not take points off. All right? I'm interested in you learning the material. So again, if you haven't turned something in or you didn't get full credit on something, you're welcome to uh, turn it in again. And there's times when I kick myself over that, right? Because towards the end of the semester when people are resubmitting stuff or submitting late work or whatever, it really increases my load grading-wise, not to make myself out as a martyr or anything, all right? But uh, I think it's worth it because, um, you know, one of the things people say, and I think they only get it half right, is people say you learn from your mistakes. Well, as I've said before, and maybe in this class even, I'm at that age where I start to repeat myself a lot, all right? Um, you don't learn from your mistakes. You can learn from your mistakes. If you learn from your mistakes, then the Cleveland Browns would win the Super Bowl for the next 20 years straight, <laughs> all right? Because they will have learned so much that no one would be able to stop them, all right? The point is, is you learn from your mistakes if you take the time to look at what you did and figure out what was wrong and take steps to correct it. So you can learn from your mistakes. And one thing I don't like about classes is, you know, you sort of get one shot at some assignments. Uh, and I try to make my classes not like that, all right? So that you take a shot at it, maybe you misunderstood the instructions or you didn't quite know how to do something. Well, okay. If you were to do that on a job, if you, were, if you had a job as a web developer and you made a mistake on something, you know, would that be the end of it? No. Your boss would say, hey, you messed up this link, go and correct it. And you'd have, the, you'd have to go and correct it. So I try to make my classes like that as well. If, 
if you don't do something the way that it is, uh, uh, it is required, then you have an opportunity to redo it. All right, um, and that gives you the opportunity to learn from the mistake and, and to do it the way um, that was expected. At any rate, onward and upward. We were talking about, last time, about website accessibility. And we listed a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of disabilities that would influence someone's ability to um, access the web. And we talked about things such as vision. Loss of hearing. Motor control. In other words, you can't move your hand correctly um, or, or um, as well as other people can. We talked about certain cognitive issues. I think we did, anyhow. We, we talked about many of these. If we didn't talk about all of them, here's a more comprehensive list. Um, and we said that under each of these, there's a full range of things. It's not just like under vision, it's not just people that are blind, right? There's people <coughs> that are blind, certainly. That's the most dramatic form of a disability concerning vision. But there's also things like colorblind, and simply having poor eyesight. Loss of hearing, we talked about people that are completely deaf and people that have partial loss. For motor control, we talked about people that in some extreme cases might be paralyzed. But we also talked about people that have um, certain uh, other conditions, cerebral palsy perhaps, where they don't have as fine of control of their hands as other people would. We talked about things like carpal tunnel, also known as repetitive stress injury, where um, if you do the same sort of motion over and over again, you can develop severe pain. And uh, heavy computer users are particularly prone to this sort of, of thing. Um, arthritis, things such as maybe Parkinson's disease, where the hands shake, and so on. Then we talked about cognitive disabilities, and we could list under here ADHD, um, cognitive neurological, epilepsy, seizures, um, dyslexia, and so on. Now, we also talked about how, while there are many people that have these disabilities, there are many other people who may be in situations where they will also benefit from the accommodations of the disability. Just like we said, like, you know, you, there might be elevators um, on campus, at least in part, to help people that um, are, are, are using crutches or are in a wheelchair or something along those lines. But an elevator can also help people that's carrying a, a heavy box go up the stairs, all right? Um, wide doors may help someone who is carrying something as well. So wide doors that are meant to accommodate people in wheelchairs can also help that, and so on. So is that, the, is that's, that is the case with um, uh, many of these web accommodations as well. Uh, a good example of that would be if you talk about loss of hearing, one of the things that you can do for people that don't have hearing is if you have any audio content on your site, have a transcript of it as well. So if there was an audio interview with someone, you could have a text version as well. Well, that certainly is going to help people that aren't able to hear, you know, that, that have a loss of hearing or that are hard of hearing or whatever. But that will also help people, for example, that are in a busy lab. A busy lab, it can get noisy. 
you know. Uh, in our lab, for example, I don't think the computers even have speakers. All right. So if you were trying to access some audio content in our lab, if you didn't happen to have headphones with you, you might not be able to. All right. So therefore, well, um, having a transcript of it would benefit you. Uh, another thing would be closed captioning, you know, the captioning under videos. Um, that can also help people that um, can't hear, but it also help people that are um, in a situation where listening to the audio content isn't possible. So, the message of this section of the lecture is this. Number one, accessibility is more than simply websites for the blind. A lot of times you hear people say that, even people that ought to know better. Think of web accessibility in terms of only what we can do for people that can't see. All right. It affects other, it, 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 it's, it's important for people with other sorts of disabilities as well. All right. People that have trouble moving, their hands, people that have trouble hearing, people that have certain cognitive or neurological conditions. A second lesson of this poor part of, of the lecture is that it's not an all or nothing thing. So things that we do for people, vision for example, it's not a case of us only needing to accommodate people that are blind. There's a full range of vision related issues that ought to be accommodated. So yeah, there's some people that aren't blind, but they may have very, very poor vision. Or they may not be blind, but they're colorblind. And all these things come into play and are important and ought to be addressed because ultimately we want to make our website accessible to everyone, right? Um, you can look at it from three different perspectives, right? You can say, first of all, I want to make my website accessible because it's the right thing to do, all right? I don't want to exclude anyone from my website, all right? It's, it's right. I want to accommodate as many people as I possibly can, simply because that's the right thing to do, all right? Second reason is a business-related reason, all right? Um, I also want to get my business revenue from people with disabilities, all right? If you think about it, like if you have an online shop, online shopping is good for people that have disabilities, right? People that have disabilities oftentimes uh, is difficult for them to get around. It's more difficult for, for them to get around than it would be for people that don't have disabilities. Therefore, if you're not you know, you can be motivated simply because it's the right thing to do to, to make your website accessible to everyone, or you can be motivated by commercial reasons. In other words, hey, I want some of that market share, all right? Finally, in some cases, there are legal issues, all right? Just as, you know, the American Disabilities Act. And I'm not a lawyer, all right, so I can't speak to those specifically, but there have been cases of organizations that have gotten sued because their website is inaccessible to people who are blind or people who have other disabilities. So the bottom line is, is that accessibility is the right thing to do and, and we want to take care of it. And by taking care of it is a matter of, again, the assistive technology that people employ, such as screen readers, and is a matter of making accommodations. Making accommodations, the technique used is called universal design. And we talked a little bit about this before. The idea of universal design is that we are creating things that work both with, for people with disabilities and people that don't have disabilities. So the accommodations we make, again, are actually going to benefit everyone. They're not merely going to benefit people that have certain disabilities. 
all right? So a transcript that we do for someone that can't hear an audio clip on the site. Also benefits someone that's in a lab that doesn't have headphones and it's, they're in, under noisy circumstances and they're not able to hear the audio or there's no speakers in their computer. All right. There's sort of two pillars of universal design. Simplicity and multiple presentation. What do I mean by multiple presentation? I mean that you show the same content more than once. You represent this, the same content more than once. A perfect example of that would be the one that I've been using as far as audio clips. All right. If I have an audio clip, that's one way of presenting a speech, for example, or a news story. All right. Having a transcript of that would be a second way. So I would pre be presenting the same material two different ways. So I would have an audio clip for people that want to listen to it, and for people who are not able to, or who are not willing to listen to it, maybe, for example, I avoid watching videos online, on news sites, for example, because I can read faster than the video plays, right? I'm a very fast reader. A lot of times, if I'm not sure if I'm interested in a news story, I don't want to sit through a five-minute news story. I just want to scan through it and, and see if it's important to me. And if it's important to me, maybe then I'll go back and watch the whole story. But again, by presenting the same content more than one way, you allow for, you accommodate for disabilities, and you provide benefit for even for people who don't have those disabilities. Now, in one respect, you can say these two things sort of fight each other. You know, wouldn't simplicity mean that you only showed things one way? Well, yeah, but that's exactly the balancing act that you do as a designer. You want to keep it simple and yet provide options for people. All right, and again, that's tricky. And that's, to a large degree, the art of web design, is figuring out how to balance things out. Now, I teach a multimedia class, all right? And we talk about different multimedia techniques that you can use. So, for example, we talk about text and, t and, and fonts and typography, it's called. We talk about images, you know, photographs. We talk about audio. We talk about video. And we talk about animation. So we talk about five different ways of presenting certain material. So for example, let's say I was uh, uh, teaching a biology class and the topic was cell division, all right? I don't know anything about cell division, but I can fake it, all right? Now, with cell division, it's like you start out with one cell that has a nucleus, it stretches out, And all of a sudden, when you're done, it splits and you got two of them. All right? Welcome to Biology 101. All right? Now, I could do that. I could represent that a couple different ways on my website. I could have a paragraph that explain that. I could create a video. In fact, we could probably have a microscope that actually showed these things happening. Probably. I don't know. Ask Dr. Kessler if you see him. You probably could do that, right? Um, I could have an audio clip of, of just what I said there, of me explaining it. I could create an animation to do that, or I could show photographs of that. Now, multiple presentation doesn't mean we're going to do all five, right? You know, you might say, well, gee, maybe each person individually would, would learn from Maybe one person would learn better from audio and one person would learn better from, you know. You don't go and throw everything at an issue that you're trying to communicate. That would violate the principle of simplicity. But I might do it a couple different ways so that I accommodate people with different disabilities. 
and allow for people that are different sorts of learners to understand it. So I might, for example, pick two of those ways. All right. So maybe I have an animation and I have text explaining what's happening. The animation would be effective, effective for people that can see. And there could be narration in an animation, maybe. All right. Or let's say there's not anim uh, um, narration in it. All right. Um, there could be text uh, on, on the animation that explains what's going on, though. <laughs> so I, I could do that, and people that, are can, that can see can, can see that, and visual learners can see that. All right. But then I have text that explains what goes on. So people that can't see or people who are more verbal can understand it from the text. So I didn't take five different ways of showing the same information. I picked two. So in that way, we're balancing these two principles of simplicity and multiple presentation. We're showing things more than one different way to accommodate people with disabilities and to um, um, accommodate people that learn differently. But we're not everything but the kitchen sink, as they say. We're not throwing everything at the problem and showing it all the different ways we possibly can because that would be overload and that would violate the notion of simplicity. So, let's go through these things and let's talk about how we can use multiple presentation and simplicity to help people with these different disabilities. What can we do for people who are completely blind that will help them? in terms of multiple presentation and or simplicity? Audio. Audio, all right. You can include audio. All right. Do keep in mind that most people that are blind that access the web will have a screen reader. All right. So therefore, they already sort of get audio for free because any text you have on your page um, can be read. I'll tell you one classic thing that you can do is I'm going to draw what am I going to do? If I had an important button on my page let's say this is an important button that does something important. I don't know what. One thing I could do is I could make this an image. With fancy cursive style writing. Or I could make it plain text. Which one of these two is more accessible to people who are <laughs> blind? The plain text. Why? Because the screen reader can read the text. The screen reader cannot interpret a button that is an image, for example. So, if you have something that's just plain text, don't use an image for it. That's something that a lot of, of web designers do is that it's like, well, I want it to look a certain way. So I'm going to go into Photoshop or GIMP or some image processing program and really craft a button that looks exactly the way that I want it to look. All right. The downfall of that then is that renders it inaccessible because a screen reader can't interpret an image that contains text. Another thing I could do is let's say I have an image of Let's say LeBron James is speaking at Lorraine Community College. I'll draw LeBron tall. If I included text on the image, that will be less accessible 
than if I had an image with a caption tag underneath it. So, one of the things that I can do is don't put images, don't put text in images. Have text separate from images because the screen reader can read the text, whereas the screen reader can't really look at an image and understand that there's text in the image. All right? So that's one thing that we can do to accommodate people, and that would be a form of multiple presentations. So instead of an image that contains text, we have text and we have an image. Using an alt attribute on all our images is important for people who are visually impaired or, or blind. So when I talked about images, I talked about an alt attribute. Having that is important. All right. What can we do for people that are colorblind? Remember, we can't, we can't design our web page to get rid of people's disabilities, but we can accommodate them. So what can we do to accommodate someone who is colorblind? Well, first of all, we can pick a high contrast between the foreground and background. I'll tell you what. This is like, this is like, you know, consider the, any video game uh, fans, consider this a cheat code, all right? If you don't have a better idea, use black text on a white background, all right? That's boring, maybe, but it gets the job done. So yeah, there's circumstances where you might want not want to do that. So for example, like we talked about a Barbie website. A Barbie website wouldn't look right. But you could use colors in other places to accent it. So even there, you could probably figure out a way to make that work. So have a high contrast between the background and the foreground. All right. Again, black text on a white background works. White text on a black background? also works. I have seen studies, however, that says that that tends to fatigue the eye a little bit more. So, if you're reading a lot, it's probably better to have black text on a white background. But have a good, clean, con a good contrast between the foreground and background. That's one thing that you can do. Now, here's the interesting thing. That's going to help people that have poor vision as well. Right? Because if you have poor vision and you're having a little trouble seeing the screen, if there's a sharp contrast between the text and the background color, it suddenly becomes easier to read. All right? What about allowing people to pick the color scheme that they want? Now, we haven't really talked about how to do that yet, but that typically would involve a little bit of JavaScript. But we've probably done 80% of that simply by talking about how you can have multiple style sheets for the same page. So I could have different themes or skins that I put on a web page. I know Angel used to do that, uh, the old content management system here at LC. I'm not sure if Canvas does that, where you can go in and you can pick the color scheme for your page. All right. And the nice thing about that is, well, for people who aren't, colorblind, well, you can pick your favorite colors. It's a nicer, friendlier looking page for you. All right? And that matters as well. But for people who are colorblind, you can pick a color combination that works best for you. All right? That's a form of multiple presentation. And again, we don't cover that completely in this class, but we put the foundation out there by talking about separating your CSS from your HTML. Allowing people to resize your page. Most browsers do a good job taking care of that already. All right. Having adequate white space on your page. Now, when you use the term white space, you're not talking about literally the color white. You're talking about blank space between stuff. 
So for example, you know, notice how for, you know, I'll write on a separate sheet of paper. Okay, here is paragraph one, here is paragraph two, versus here is paragraph one. Don't ask me why I'm writing so small. Here is paragraph two. So simply by spacing things out more and putting more space between the paragraphs, putting more space between the lines in a paragraph, putting more space between the words in a sentence. All these things can help for people who have poor eyesight. And they can help for people who are colorblind. And later on we'll see, they'll help for people who are dyslexic as well. All right? As well as using a clear font and allowing people to be able to choose the font that they have. All right? Another thing with colorblind, that you can do is use other techniques in addition to color if you want to indicate something special. So for example, if I make my links blue, some people aren't going to be able to distinguish the fact that, those, that, that certain text is blue and certain text is black. But if I make my links blue and underlined, then it becomes more obvious that, hey, this is a link. <laughs> So if you're going to use color to mean something special, for example, this is a link, all right, or this is a warning message, you know, don't you love the warning messages that they put on medication, you know, they usually rattle them off very quickly at the, at the end, you know, this may cause sleeplessness or drowsiness. And it's funny that like a lot of those side effects like are the exact opposite. You might not be able to sleep or you might sleep all the time. You know, that's the two side effects that you might get from that. But if I wanted to have a warning, if I was a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company and I wanted to put a warning on my page, I might make it red to really stand out. All right? Again, people that are colorblind can't distinguish that it's red. I might then use another technique in typography. For example, I might make it red in italics to make it stand out. So don't just use color. Use color plus something else. That's a form of multiple presentation. So what are my warning messages? They're red and in italics. So someone that's not colorblind will see a warning red and in italics. Someone that is colorblind will see it in italics. So they might not be able to distinguish the fact that the text is red, but they will be able to distinguish the fact that, hey, there's something special about this text because it's in italics. All right? Again, we can't completely counteract the disability, but we can accommodate for it. Loss of hearing, we talked about that already. That largely would be providing text uh, for audio or captioning on any video that you have. Unfortunately, most captioning needs to be done manually to be effective. Um, on YouTube, for example, you can go and you can turn on captioning on any video. That usually doesn't do a very good job. All right? Automated captioning isn't particularly good. So if it's something truly important, you should provide a manual human created caption of it. All right? There is software that allows you to take audio or video and create a transcript for it. Um, I did a little bit of research on this for a side project that I was working on. But most of that software works best if there's only one speaker so that you can train the software to recognize the particular way that they pronounce certain words. And it, it works best if you sort of, quote, train that software to recognize certain words. It also works better if there's limited uh, number of uh, uh, words uh, that, that you say. 
you know. So for example, to simply hear, you know, if like like on the phone, for example, uh, it will ask you, are you calling about a current account? And you say yes or no. Well, voice recognition software can very easily recognize multiple speakers saying yes or no. But if they were to say, please tell us your life story, where you would be different for every person, then voice recognition software has a harder time with that. Now, the, now fortunately, this is getting better. All right. Um, voice recognition now is doing much better than it has done in the past. And there may be a point where this becomes less of an issue. But right now, I would say that if you have audio or video, um, it would be best to have a human prepare a transcript uh, for it and caption it. Issues with motor control. What are some accommodations we can make for people who have a hard time moving the mouse? Exactly, keyboard options. You can create links that have keyboard shortcuts. All right. So if they want to go to your home page, you, you could put a keyboard shortcut where Control H takes you to the home page so that they don't have to move the mouse over and click it. So that's a form of multiple presentation, right? You can click on the link or you can use a keyboard shortcut. Another thing in the area of simplicity would be, again, having adequate white space. Don't make the link so closely uh, close together. All right. Allow for adequate space between the links so that someone that has trouble controlling the mouse um, can go and can point to the link that they want to. So make the link big enough and far enough apart from the other links. So again, a case of having extra white space. Simplicity. Now here's the interesting thing. A lot of these things really boil down to just good web design, right? When we talked about good web design, we talked about not having too much information on a page and not having too much clutter and having space between your elements on the page so stuff doesn't run together. Well, that's important also from an accessibility perspective. So again, the notion of universal design is that it's not designing specifically for people with disabilities, it's designing for everyone. And some of the things we do also benefit people with disabilities. Certain cognitive issues. For example, dyslexia. What are some things that we could do for people with dyslexia? Font selection would be one. If possible, allow the user to select the font. That's easier for them to read. All right. Again, that's a little beyond what we cover in this class, but we have a good start by our study of CSS. Certain fonts are easier to read than others for people that are dyslexic. The very ornate fonts that are very uh, fancy people with dyslexia tend to be able to read the simpler fonts a little easier. Um, there's whole studies done on this that you can, you can look up to get more information on it. Using adequate white space so the words don't run together. Again, here we're hearing adequate white space again, having a lot of space in it. Don't cram things together too much. All right. Um, and doing things like including images along with it. So if you were talking about something, if you have an image of what you're talking about, that helps someone that's dyslexic put what you're talking about in context. So if they see an image associated with the words, if they get confused about a word, all right, well then that picture can maybe help bring them to understand what's going on a little bit. So again, multiple presentations, images along with the text. What about people with ADHD? What are some things that you can do or avoid doing? 
Yeah, avoid too much information on a page. Avoid gratuitous animation, you know. Fortunately, we don't see this as much as we used to, but back so many years ago, people thought it would be really great to have a spinning logo and have all these things going on and, and all that. And fortunately, people have discovered that that's not really a good idea. And it's not a good idea for anyone, right? Because I don't want something that's distracting. I don't want something that's going to take, that's going to make the page long to download. All right? And people with ADHD um, don't need something additional on the page to distract them. So not having things cluttered, not having uh, things on the page that don't really belong. So again, in accommodating people with disabilities, to a large degree, it's a restatement of basic good web design principles. The right amount of content on the page, not too much, not too little. Space between the content. Um, showing things different ways. Showing things with text, showing things with images. All these things are things that we can do that make your page better designed even for people without disabilities and perform a valuable service for, with people that do have disabilities. The one thing, again, that we, we are just going to introduce the notion of that you would need to know some JavaScript to sort of close the loop would be the other thing that's valuable is being able to provide user options. User options in terms of font and color and, and so on. And in that way, you can allow people to pick sort of the presentation that is going to benefit them. That requires some JavaScript, but the good practices that we establish in this class of separating HTML from CSS is beneficial. Are there any questions on this? All right, that's all I had for today. Remember to get your project design in and to let me know if you have any questions concerning it.